on a CT scan. It's been a moneymaker for years. The question is whether it's worth doing. A trial of common painkillers comparing their ability to cause heart attacks. A way to bring down the cost and perhaps increase the availability of some of the most expensive cancer drugs. And two trials which suggest that an automated online therapy program for insomnia works. And there's a strong Australian connection. The person who's led the project for some years is Lee Ritterband, Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioural Sciences at the University of Virginia. Welcome to The Health Report. Thanks for having me. So how do you define insomnia? Difficulty falling asleep, difficulty waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to get back to sleep, waking too early in the morning, or just not feeling like you've had a good night's sleep. But the the message here is that you're bothered by it because some people might have the same sort of issues, but they're not bothered by it. That's right. Absolutely. And where did the idea that cognitive behavioral therapy might work for insomnia? Because you would think, well, you're yeah. waking up, so why bother? I mean, why, what's going to make a difference to your sleep if you are told to think differently about it? Yeah, well, I mean, kind of behavioral therapy is a general approach that actually has been found to be pretty efficacious in a number of different areas, and insomnia and sleep happen to be one of them that it is particularly good at addressing. It focuses on how we think and how we feel and the connection between the two. And what we find is that a lot of the difficulties that people have with their sleep are wrapped up in how they're thinking about their sleep and the anxiety that revolves around their sleep. And so there is some cognitive work that focuses on thinking differently about how we sleep. And the behavior piece is really focused on implementing certain rules and guidelines and strategies that can improve the actual process of sleep. That's so called sleep hygiene. That's the, the, the bed just for sleeping and sex and not for working and not for watching television and go to bed at the same time each night and don't have coffee before you go to bed and that sort of thing. That's right. Actually, you combine both the sleep hygiene as well as the stimulus control strategies. There's three kind of areas in there. There's sleep hygiene, which is a lot of the things people already know. Don't drink coffee close to bed. You know, Don't exercise close to bed. Some of those issues. There are these stimulus control techniques that we're trying to disconnect the body's tendency to be awake when in bed and not asleep. And so there's an attempt to modify that through some rules, which is what the stimulus control rules are. And then there's this third piece, which is sleep restriction, which is a bit paradoxical in the sense that we actually restrict people's sleep initially in order to improve the efficiency of their sleep. So what we see is that a lot of folks come in with a really poor sleep efficiency, and we we calculate sleep efficiency by looking at what percentage of time are people asleep when they're in bed. So if if I'm sleeping for five hours a night, but I'm in bed for 10 hours, then I have a 50% sleep efficiency, and we really want to get people up over 85%. And to do that, we will often encourage a shorter period of time of being in bed to sleep as a way of consolidating sleep during that period. And the stimulus control? The stimulus control are the rules that you were starting to mention before. You know, only use the bed for sleep and sex, don't watch television or do other things in bed. You get out of bed if you're not asleep within 20 minutes. All of those rules are put in place in order to break the connection of being awake when in bed. You've been one of the international pioneers, along with Helen Christensen at the Black Dog and others, of online therapy. So you instituted this as an online piece where you didn't actually have to have a therapist. You did this as part of an online program called Shut Eye. Just tell us a little bit about the study. The study was looking at the use of this online program, Shut Eye, and following people over a period of a year to see how well does the intervention, and this is a fully automated interactive, tailored program. There's no human support involved in it. And we wanted to see if we gave this to people, if we had them use it, how well would it work over a longer period of time? And we looked at people right after they used it, at six months after they used it, and then at one year to see how they were doing. And how did they go? Great. Just really strong, positive, robust outcomes. We've done a number of studies with Shut Eye now over the last few years. And this study was particularly of interest because we were really opening it up to a lot of different kinds of people, people who had already different issues that were going on, psychiatric issues like depression or anxiety, as well as medical problems, whether they had asthma or cancer or other medical problems. Over 50% of the people who were in this trial had one or both of those kinds of issues. And so we really wanted to see if Shut Eye worked in this real world kind of setting. And the findings were as strong as we've ever seen. So faster to sleep, 
longer sleeping times, that sort of thing. Yeah, faster to sleep, not being awake as long in the middle of the night, having much improved sleep. In fact, over half of the group who got shut eye were what we call treatment remitters. They were not having any insomnia anymore at one year. And you did another study with Helen Christensen at the Black Dog and others at the ANU and Sydney University looking at yeah. people with depression. What was the finding there? Yeah, that was a fantastic study. We recruited over a 1,000 people in Australia, and everybody in that trial had insomnia but were also at risk for major depression. And what we found was is that if we treated those who had insomnia and at risk for major depression, that we could not only significantly improve their sleep, which we did, but we also significantly decreased their depressive aspect. They were not feeling as depressed anymore. Insomnia and depression definitely are comorbid. They often come together. Sometimes the depression leads to the insomnia, sometimes the insomnia leads to the depression, and oftentimes they're just comorbid, meaning that they happen around the same time. You're not the only program that offers cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. How, do you, mm. how does yours rate with the others? Yeah, there are some other programs, um, and, and there are some that have some good data. The, the concern is that people who are looking to consume these programs is to really make sure that the programs that they want to buy or to use has some real evidence base behind them, but nothing comes close to the robustness of uh, the data we see with shut-eyed. And if you want it in Australia, you can get it via the Black Dog Institute? You can, yeah. You can go to the Black Dog Institute's webpage and they should have a box there or a, a link there that you can select to go and get shut-eye right from there. And there is a charge for shut-eye, by the way. Lee Ritterbrand is Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. And you're listening to The Health Report here on RN, ABC News Radio and CBC Radio across Canada. I'm Norman Swan. Some of the commonest painkillers bought across the counter are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. Medications like ibuprofen or naproxen, the trade names are Nurofen or naproxen. There's been a suspicion that in some people they may increase the risk of a heart attack, particularly a newer, supposedly lower-risk NSAID called celecoxib, Celebrex. Well, now a huge trial has been published comparing these three NSAIDs and their heart risks. And one of the authors was Professor Neville Yeomans of Western Sydney University and the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. And he joins me in the studio now. Welcome, Neville. Glad to be with you, Norman. It's a huge study. Yes, it took a long while. It's been a lot of work. But at the end of the day, I think it's been worth it. So, so let's just talk about why do NSAIDs in theory increase the risk of a heart attack? Well, you know, that in itself, I think that theory is pretty muddied. But more to the point, they, they did appear that they, they, they do increase the risk a little bit. The, if I just wind back a tiny bit, um, the problem with the NSAIDs that I think most people know is they, they do cause some damage to the gut and can cause a bleeding ulcer. So when it was worked out that there was one molecule they block that's bad for the stomach, and the other one they block is good for the pain and inflammation. That's when the selective COX-2 uh, NSAIDs were developed. Uh, and to begin and with... that's what celecoxib is. That's right. That, and then infamously, there was a sister drug called rofecoxib. Right, and you're bringing me really to what was the main uh, cause, source of the concern in a big study, because these drugs seemed generally pretty safe and were likely to cause less um, ulcers and less bleeding, uh, both Celebrex and um, Rofecoxib were trialled to try to prevent bowel cancer. The irony is that both of them showed benefit in that, but after about 18 months, um, in two of the studies and not the third, there began to be slightly more heart attacks, and it got to the extent with Rofecoxib of being about twice as much. Could have been chance, but seemed unlikely to be chance, so there was suddenly concern about the whole whole family of them. And there was an element of hiding the results and rofecoxib ended up getting taken off the market. Some of that's true, actually, and it was perhaps almost surprising that Celebrex remained, although it did appear to have rather different properties. And uh, what we also know now is that probably all of the NSAIDs slightly increase the risk of a heart attack, and we didn't know that because in the old days they were never tested to the same level. So Pfizer, the drug company, funded this study to compare Celebrex against two other common ones, ibuprofen and um, naproxen. Yes, they. I think they really were planning to look into this anyway. In fact, I know they were with a, a study they didn't to go ahead with, but then the Food and Drug Administration in the state said, look, it, it, this is a, is a concern. And so they mandated the study and Pfizer then had no choice. It, um, 
it, it's been a, a big and expensive exercise. And you were independent of the drug company? We were. In fact, they, the steering committee, um, uh, in fact, interestingly, every member of the executive committee every year signed an affidavit that they'd take no, uh, no finance from any maker of any NSAID. So what did you find? Well, the key thing was, was there going to be a difference in cardiovascular so really, deaths? Um, and these were people who with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. So they were taking it for pain relief for their arthritis. Absolutely. They needed it. Uh, they'd proven they needed it. They'd been on it for at least six months. It was judged that they needed to continue with it for up to, you know, three or four years. Uh, and um, they were told that one of the drugs might increase their risk of a heart attack. So, you know, that was brave people to tackle it. The primary endpoint was just that. Was there an increased risk of cardiac death, myoc acute myocardial infarction, That's that is heart attack, attack and, uh, and acute stroke? It was the first time I've been involved with what's called a non-inferiority trial, where you start from the very beginning to plan the study uh, on the assumption that, that there will be a difference and you want to find out if there is. Normally you're doing things in the reverse order. The answer to cap to the chase was that, perhaps almost to the surprise of some of us, there was no difference between the three NSAIDs in cardiac risk. There was actually a trend to slightly less on the, the one that's safer for the stomach. And perhaps most importantly, there was a one-third reduction in all-cause mortality that was statistically significant. So was that from bowel cancer or what? No, most of them will have been cardiovascular, renal, GI. Uh, look, I can't actually tell you the full <laughs> breakdown of the deaths. But it could have been a few things. Oh, yes, there would have been others. But there have been other studies which show that um, ibuprofen does raise the risk of heart. I mean, so, so in other words, what, what you didn't answer was if you didn't take any NSAIDs, would you have had a lower risk of a heart attack or stroke? That, that's a really good question, and to really answer it well would be a randomised trial where you put somebody on a placebo for three, three years who had an increased risk of heart disease and had bad joints, and no one could ever do that. So we have to fall back on epidemiologic studies, uh, and the epidemiology suggests there's probably a slight increase with all of them. There's one study that's just under review at the moment from Quebec province where they've got wonderful data linkage that said that the uh, the increase in risk with uh, probably a bit unfair for me to say this because it hasn't gone through full peer review but I've got this far to say it looked like about a 10% increase with celecoxib and a little bit more with most of the others but you know these aren't poison this is not like smoking and lung cancer so what's you know just cutting now just going to a few minutes left, seconds left so what's a person to do? They've got arthritis and they're, let's say, they've got high cholesterol. The doctor's told them they're high risk of, a, of heart disease. Should they t is it safe to go and buy one of these off the counter? Well, look, I think based on what we've found, I, if it were me, I, I would be inclined to take one of them by prescription. That means your doctor's looking after you closely. Oh, I should say that all of these patients were taking a, a, an anti-ulcer drug which um, adds a little expense, but also made the whole thing safer. So, you know, if they've got bad joints, they've got to do something for pain, and if they can't exercise, that's bad for the heart. I think it's important to control pain. So just get it in balance. And the celecoxib had lower risk of stomach problems, but it, had, it, was, it wasn't so good for pain relief. That was the other thing. Would, yes, maybe so. There was a slight difference against one of the other two drugs and not the other. So, yep, yeah, fair comment. Neville, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Neville Yeomans, who is Director of Research at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne. The Australian healthcare system, and often you and me as consumers, spend a fortune on testing to see whether we have heart disease or at risk of a heart attack. One such test is called a coronary calcium score. It involves a CT scan of the heart, looking at how much calcium is built up in the coronary arteries. We've covered this before in the health report, questioning the value of a coronary calcium score. Well, now the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute is starting a study in otherwise healthy people with a close family history of heart disease at a relatively young age. The person leading the study is Tom Marwick, who's the Baker Institute's director, and he's in our Melbourne studio. Welcome to the health report, Tom. Hi, Norman. Thanks for the invitation. So what's the question you're trying to answer here? Well, it really arises from clinical interaction. I quite often see people who have a family history of heart disease. Uh, they may say come in to say that their father died at the age of 58 and they're in their early 50s and what should they do? And um, obviously in that situation you need to 
ask the patient carefully about symptoms, um, and, and sometimes they actually have symptoms that they they haven't admitted to anybody previously, and then you treat that on the, on its own merits. But many individuals are truly asymptomatic, and then you calculate their risk using a risk calculator. And, so just um, to explain that, that, that brings together your family history, whether you smoke, your blood pressure, your cholesterol levels and various other factors, and, yeah. then, and then you get a score, your percentage chance of a heart attack in the next five or ten years. Yeah, that's right. So, um, And that's what you would do really for, for a, a routine sort of over the age of 40 check. Um, and uh, then, you know, you, you can identify some people at, uh, at very low risk uh, and a, ver- a few people at very high risk. And then there's a group in between at intermediate risk where you're really trying to balance up the fact that they haven't got a very high risk of disease, but they have a family history. And unfortunately, the risk calculators don't take family history into account. So it's a, it's a frequent problem and it's a, it's a source of frustration to all, I think. And that's where you're, t- you're testing this ground of the coronary calcium score. Yeah, so our plan was to, um, was to take these uh, people with a family history, do a coronary calcium score on them. If they had a score of between 0 and 400, then to randomise them to a study with a statin or none. People over the score of 400, you know, clearly have coronary disease. And so they so need... this, is, this is like a cutoff, you're talking about the 400? Yeah, it's, um, so uh, the, the, the score is derived from the total extent of calcium in the vasculature and it's kind of a reflection of the amount of atherosclerosis in, in the arteries. Um, and a, a score of 400 is a, is a meaningful score, you know, prognostically and, um, and warrants some further evaluation, perhaps a stress test. Very commonly that's negative. But um, those individuals, I think you could make a pretty strong argument to treat them with a statin. The individuals with a calcium score of zero have got a very low risk. Um, It's a very reassuring finding. Um, And uh, the people in the middle, um, it's very difficult to know what to do with them. Look, I thought, so we we first covered this years ago when it first came on on the market. And before the studies were done and it was thought it was pretty useless that you mm. could have a zero coronary calcium score and drop down dead of a heart attack the next day. Mm. <laughs> um, but I think the CT scans have improved since then. But nowadays you've got what's called CT coronary angiograms, which are fairly mm. benign tests. Check your coronary arteries. If they're as clean as, clean as a whistle, off you go. And if it finds something, then you can go on to, say, having a... A stress echo or something like that. Is there much point what, what, with a CT coronary angio available to you? Why would you bother doing coronary calcium? Well, I think they're giving different signals. I think when you when you do the CT coronary angiogram, you, you're looking for the presence of obstructive disease. And, and when you're doing... Well, isn't that what you're looking for in the coronary calcium score? Too? No, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. No, you're, you're looking for evidence of atherosclerotic plaque in the coronary arteries. So... If you find a coronary calcium score of zero, those individuals are extremely unlikely to have plaque in the coronary. So I, I think one of them and is And probably really just to, the missing bit here for the audience is that calcium lands there and sticks from the blood supply. And that's as a kind of marker of the, of the plaque, of the, of, the, of the cholesterol plaque. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a disease marker rather than a rather than a risk factor. Absolutely. So this isn't something that's bad about calcium that that uh, comes to sit in your coronary arteries and cause mischief. It's it's kind of a a bystander in the disease process, but it's a marker of the disease. Yeah. So if you like, it's so. What have you found so far? I realise the trial's just getting going. Yeah, so we've been going actually for a, a couple of years. It's a multi-center study, uh, really, in all of the capital cities. Um, and um, uh, we obviously have follow-up to do for several years more, but we do have the baseline data. And it's very interesting that um, these folk who are at intermediate risk with a family history of premature disease, I, I would have thought that those individuals will be very likely to have evidence of, of coronary disease. In fact, 50% of them have had a, a score of zero. Very, 50%? Very, yeah, very reassuring result. Is that because and they're, not one they're that I scared as hell and they're living pristine lives? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I suppose uh, there is a significant genetic component to this disease. And I suppose their lives aren't that pristine because they're at intermediate risk. So they've got, you know, an elevated cholesterol or they smoke or, or, or have high blood pressure. 
Um, so, no, I don't think so. I, I, I think the message from this is that there is actually a different signal from the, cor- from the coronary calcium score than we're getting from the coronary risk evaluation. I think maybe it's a reflection of the protective process that you can expose two people to the same levels of risk factors. So one of them develops coronary disease and the other does not. And uh, time will tell whether intervening makes a difference. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I, I think, um, uh, as you said in the introduction, I think we've, we've jumped the gun on this and um, uh, people are being managed as though we've proven this, but, but in fact we haven't. We have shown that the uh, presence of calcium is a marker of disease and we've shown that it's a marker of, of prognosis, but we have not shown uh, that by intervening that we can change the outcome. And this trial will show that for the, for the first time. And you're looking for people with first or second degree relatives with uh, early premature heart disease. How do they participate in the trial if they want to? Yes, so all they need to do is to uh, go to the Baker Institute website and uh, look under under patients and uh, there's a list of trials there and the trial is called CAUGHT, CAD, C-A-U-G-H-T-C-A-D for coronary artery disease. And all you need to do is have a CT scan of the heart. Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, thank you. Tom Marwick is director of the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne. Generic medicines are cheaper versions of branded medications once they've come out of patent and can be made and sold by other companies. Governments rely on generics to keep costs down, but most generics are of drugs which are relatively simple chemicals to manufacture, like statins, for example. But the most expensive drugs on the market these days are so-called biologics. They're very complex, usually antibodies designed to block very specific lock and key mechanisms in cells. They cost tens of thousands of dollars a year, and the patent holders have been hoping that it will be too hard for generic companies to to design them. A recent study, though, showed a so-called biosimilar performed well compared to the branded product, in this case, Herceptin, for women with breast cancer. One of the researchers was Hope Rugo, Director of Breast Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Welcome to the Health Report. Thanks for having me. I mean, this is a big story, isn't it, that a biosimilar has actually had a randomized trial because the pharmaceutical industry is saying, oh, you can't copy our drugs and we're going to have the market forever. I think it's very exciting. And actually, when this paper came out, I had a sudden realization that what I went into medicine for as a starry-eyed, less than 10-year-old, which was to sort of help the world, that this was maybe the closest I'd gotten to it. You know, that by helping these people do a study, which will we expect to lead to approval of a biosimilar for trastuzumab, will improve access to this life-saving antibody worldwide. A lot of this is going to be due to the development of competition. The drug costs will come down. So just tell us about the, the biosimilar. So we're talking here, the trade name of the drug that's not the biosimilar, the original one is Herceptin. And this is really one of the first targeted drugs in cancer and aimed at breast cancer, but probably other cancers as well. What is the biosimilar? In the late 80s, there was an identification that a gene could be amplified or increased in number in some cancers called HER2 or HERB2. And over the next decade, an antibody was developed against that receptor. We call it a targeted biologic therapy. And what's really been amazing over the last 20 years is that from the development of that antibody till now, most women can be cured of HER2 positive early stage breast cancer by using that antibody, Herceptin or Trastuzumab, and another one which is added to it. And we understand that adding these antibodies to chemotherapy really improves survival, even in patients with incurable breast cancer, and it improves survival for a median of a year and a half even, or two years. So it's really a big deal. So the idea behind the biosimilar is that you're taking a biologic product, this antibody, and making a drug that's very similar to it. But clinically, how the drug is cleared, whether you make antibodies to it, all these other kind of biochemical tests that are done in the laboratory and in animals, that the drug is similar to enough of a degree that you don't see differences in its clinical activity or its side effects. So what were the results of this randomized trial? So this randomized trial showed that if you have developed recurrent breast cancer that fits this criteria, is HER2 positive, which is about 20 to 25 percent of breast cancer, and you are randomized to receive a chemotherapy drug plus either the branded Herceptin or this 
proposed biosimilar, the results in terms of response to the treatment and then the duration of response to treatment are identical. In addition, there were no differences in toxicity. Now, response rates mean the tumour shrinks, you, you, you get an observable response. But what counts for women is years of survival. Do you have any comparative data on that? That data has existed since the first trials came out using Herceptin, the branded trastuzumab. So this drug, because it has been similar with the other criteria, will be expected to be similar with survival as well. And so that you could say, oh, well, I, c I get to choose. I'm not stuck with this one antibody. And the I can use one of those two antibodies. So I can actually bargain to get the best deal. Hopefully the biosimilars will be at a substantial enough discount so that more people will be able to afford longer therapy. One of the problems with targeted therapy, and this is across the board in treating cancer, is that you give it for a long time when it works well. So then the costs just keep you know, building up. So you really need it to be less expensive because you're not just getting it for three months. If it works, you know, I have patients who've been on branded Herceptin for a decade. Which is you know, several hundred thousand dollars, if not more. Now, the, Probably more. <laughs> yeah. So a few weeks ago in Australia, the highest cost drug list was published. And it was very different from the list of drugs that are most commonly prescribed. And a lot of them were these monoclonal antibody drugs for autoimmune disease, for cancer and other things. So more and more are coming on. And they generally cost 60, 80, sometimes even $100,000 a year. How generalizable are the findings from this particular monoclonal antibody, the trastuzumab, to you think other monoclonal antibody drugs which are costing health systems around the world a fortune? Well, I think that this is a whole new era. I think one of the key things to remember is that the branded drug has to reach the end of its patent to be able to sell these drugs in most countries. There are biosimilars that are on the market now for autoimmune diseases. There is a biosimilar marketed and approved in the United States for a growth factor that helps white blood cells stay strong during chemotherapy. This will be the first antibody for the treatment of cancer. And I think what it's going to do is open a floodgate of you know, studies and approvals for other antibodies. For example, there was a study looking at another antibody we don't use in breast cancer, but is used in a number of other cancers, bevacizumab or avastin. And that study also showed similarity so that that cost can also be reduced. But essentially what we're talking about here is the potential for generics in the monoclonal antibody market. Yes. You know, you asked about survival, and it's a really interesting thing. A lot of people have asked about endpoints, what we call, you know, like, so can you show that the survival is the same? But it's important to keep in mind that the regulatory agencies developed the criteria for establishing biosimilarity, keeping in mind that if you require all of the same steps as the originator product, it's going to cost the same amount. So what you want to do is to get a drug that is similar by the main criteria. Thank you very much for joining us on The Health Report. A pleasure to be here and thanks for your interest. Hope Rugo, who's Director of Breast Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Centre. I'm Norman Swan. This has been The Health Report. Do join me next week.